my first films. I got so angry with the director. He pulled me up and was kind of saying some things to me. Basically, you're doing a bad job. And I went home and I was saying to Deb, I said, you know, this director, that director. She listened to it and she said, can I be honest with you? I said, yeah. She goes, I don't think you've done that work. I'm doing the research, I'm doing the work, I'm knowing what you want the scene to be. She I've called you out. She called me out. Wow. And was I partly right about the director? Sure. But actually the thing I take away from that was her going, you could have done better. Uh, and I remember on my f doing the first X-Men movie, it was a l I came in late, I felt a bit behind the eight ball. I started shooting four weeks into filming because uh, I was replacing the guy who was playing the role. So I came in feeling a bit behind the eight ball and there was a rhythm going and I I just felt a bit uncomfortable. And, and I, I remember him giving me that advice. He goes, your stuff is good. It's that idea that when the things most matter, you so desperately don't want to destroy it for being scared that you can really destroy it. Sure. Uh, when I hosted the Oscars, I was, I was like, wow, man, this is a billion people. And I just thought, OK, whatever you do, just remember, you're a kid from Moronga in Sydney. You're hosting the Oscars. Have some fun, you know? And luckily for me, those turning points, I've somehow always stuck to that idea of just having fun. And un even if it feels uncomfortable, that can sometimes be right. I think so often, not only on film, but in life, we so want to feel comfortable, but that doesn't always bring the best results. If I look back, I think some of my more successful things, in my point of view, have been the things I've been most nervous about and probably most unsure when I began. Uh, there's something about jumping off that cliff, which uh, means you end up going for broke and probably end up taking a few more risks, if you know what I mean. And I know it's easy, and you hear people all the time thanking their team their agents and it always feels like perfunctory. Well, when I came to Hollywood, I was about 30 years old. I wasn't a kid. I felt I understood people a little bit. I had no idea really. I met a thousand people and three of those people I met are still with me today, 15 years later. And I, my whole approach to meeting them and trying to decide who I was going to work with was the Aussie good bloke rule because I had no idea if anyone could do their job. I mean, everyone seemed great to me. So I just applied if they seem like a good bloke, if they seem like they're true to the word, if they seem like they're genuine, then I'm going to go with it. And I did. I just lucked out. Not only are they good blokes, they're unbelievable at their job. For entrepreneurs out there, what role has failure played in your life or what advice do you give? I remember when I went into acting, I was like, the only businesses that worked were when the owner, for the first five years, would work seven days a week. Basically, it was their baby. So when I graduated, I thought, I'm going to not wait for the phone to ring one day. That was my commitment for five years. And I thought, if I can't pay the rent after five years, I'm out. So I would say that as a basic rule, it sort of worked for me. Don't sit back, don't wait for the bank loan to come through, don't wait for people to find your product or for the advertiser to call you. Do whatever you have to do, hustle, hustle, hustle. If it hasn't worked after four years, keep going. Mm. If it hasn't worked after 20 years, stop immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and stop borrowing money from your parents, no. But give it a certain period and have a plan for that five years. You need to be able to be accountable. So after six months, you should say, we're not hitting any target. We, we were gonna open that shop three months ago. Why haven't we? And so you have to keep adjusting, accommodating. We started this business seven years ago. I honestly thought we'd be where we are today, probably about three years ago. You suffer from a bit of anxiety when you're in front of the camera, mm. but that you name your your confident personality, Frank. Yeah, oh my God. And your, oh, yeah. and, your, and your anxious personality, Charles. Yeah. Uh, most scared I've ever been was being asked to sing at the MCG. Uh, for the Bledisloe Cup. And I'm a big rugby fan, I was brought up in Sydney, so rugby was my sport. And they said, come and sing. And I actually had a panic attack the night before because all the people, I was at a dinner party and people were telling stories of how careers had finished by singing a dad version. <laughs> yeah, Meatloaf doesn't tour anymore, I'll tell you that. That does not happen. And that someone got up and sang it a cappella, got off key, got booed, literally singing the anthem. And I have never been more scared than that moment. And I. What happened to me in film was it was random. It would appear sometimes, and that was something I'd never encountered. I understand if you're scared of heights, you're always scared of heights, but some days I'd be fine, and then some days I would just get nervous and then get in my head. So 
Uh, I don't know if you guys know uh, Anthony Robbins. You know the, the oh the American... motivational motivational dude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he does motivate. He's not really a motivational guy. Actually, he's really quite brilliant in breaking down how we think the patterns of behaviour we have. So he said, you've got to remember the times we feel confident. Name that character. Name the character that feels scared. And as you're walking on a set, realise that the fear is good that it got you where you are, that it makes you work. The fear sometimes actually goes, oh, I better work really hard on this film. Like when I was with Les Mis, I was really nervous. So he said that fear, embrace it, work really hard. And then on that day when you walk on set, Charles, Charlie, Charles, <laughs> thanks, but I don't need It's all, sorry, man. It's always, how's Deb? It's not about work. And I think that's him living with probably some of his regrets and feelings of maybe he, you know, at the wrong time, put too much into his career. And uh, he doesn't want me to make that mistake. And so in his gentle way, he always reminds me, this is the most important thing. I think it's the most difficult form ever to pull off in film. When it works, it's spectacular. When it doesn't, it stinks to high heaven. This film is either gonna be a hit or it's gonna be a massive bust. Yep. Why did you take the risk on it? Jean Valjean is the holy grail for me. It's, I know that it demands everything from me as a singer, as an actor, to pull it off. It's the right. Your parents, I believe, need to be honored. You know, then you need to, and when I say honoured, have a real relationship. Talk with them. I, I miss this, Mom, Dad. I, I, I did want this. I didn't get this. I love you. I know you're doing your best. I want to, yeah, but I want to have a real relationship with you. And as you become an adult, you know, I think that's, that's important. And also having faith and believing and doing the right thing pays off. Genuinely like to be friendly with everyone. In the Australian film industry, everyone talks to everyone and if they're not making fun of you, then they really don't like you. So there's a problem. And I also, when I first went to America, I noticed there was an unspoken, and it's not, people tell stories of don't look this actor in the eye and all that. I've never heard that before, but there is a, a slightly unwritten rule of leave the actor alone, let them do their thing. It could be about process, it could be because their style, I'm not sure. And I always try, literally on the first day to break that down because I feel self-conscious in that environment. I'd much prefer a grip to, you know, making fun of me than calling me Mr. Jackman and then saying nothing until they say, thank you, it's been great working with you. You know, I much prefer to feel we're in it together. I hate it when sometimes the fear gets in the way. I hate that feeling of fear. I hate being afraid. I was a very fearful kid. I was afraid of the dark, I was afraid of heights. I froze rock climbing, you know, and my friends, my friends, I hated that idea. And I made myself get over those fears, yeah. right? And now I'm no longer, but if anything comes up to me, and I know you relate. The things most matter. You so desperately don't want to destroy it for being scared yeah. that you can really destroy it. Sure. Uh, when I hosted the Oscars, I was, I was like, wow, man, this is a billion people. And I just thought, okay. Whatever you do, just remember, you're a kid from Moronga in Sydney. You're hosting the Oscars, have some fun, yeah. you know? And luckily for me, those turning points, I've somehow always stuck to that idea of just having fun. Stuff on your worst days. Always say, okay, what could I have done, honestly? And if you can't do that, honestly, you better have someone around you that can. There was a point in one of my first films, I got so angry with the director. He pulled me up and was kind of saying some things to me. Basically, you're doing a bad job. And I went home and I was saying to Deb, I said, you know, this director and that director, la la la. She listened to it and she said, can I be honest with you? And I said, yeah. And she goes, I don't think you've done enough work. I'm doing the research, I'm doing the work, I'm knowing what you want the scene to be. She I've called you out. It. She called me out. Wow. And was I partly right about the director? Sure. But actually the thing I take away from that was her going, you could have done better. So what were you afraid of? Not being in my best. Not being for, in my best when it mattered. For Valjean. Valjean. I mean, it's happened before. Yeah. But basically, he said, you cannot get rid of those nerves or the fit. You can't get rid of them. And they appear for a reason. Because maybe you need to do more work. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not ready. Yeah. 
That fear drives you. You said without that fear, you would not be here today. You change bodies the way other actors change costumes. Well, this is your tool as much as your voice, as much as your emotions. And so I've always taken that very seriously. And I love playing Wolverine. It's a great character, but I want it to be better than last time. I want it to be physically in better shape. Otherwise, there's no point doing it. But look, you're a successful guy. You don't have anything to prove to anyone. You have this little voice in your head telling you to do more, do better. Mm. If I didn't have that, I wouldn't be sitting here opposite you. Um, at the same time, for the sake of people around me, it'd be nice to be able to put it down for a while. You know? It's a complete blessing I mean, in every way. Uh, it's one of the greatest things ever to happen in my life. And uh, both my children are more than a blessing, the greatest gift I have. Oscar's 12 and Ava's 7, and they are just the greatest blessings in my life. They're such a joy. Choices, making choices. I've, I, learned the hard way sometimes doing things that I didn't feel were right, went against my gut on it. That's hard. And I, do, I really try to avoid that now. Even and, and, and actually failure, if you really believe in it when you say yes, is fine. You learn so much about yourself. What, what have you learned parent. from your children? Oh, patience, <laughs> understanding and definitely humility. I had no idea. I remember finishing the first movie and a, a mate of mine who was in Hollywood, who was a, a player in Hollywood, he goes, dude, I've, I've heard not very good things about the movie. You really should book something else before it comes out. So there was about a four month gap. He goes, just make sure you got something else because when it comes out, you're back down the bottom of the pile again. You know, Happily, he was wrong, but I mean, no one really knew. There was no comic book genre. There was, you know, comic yeah. book movies were really not around at the time. I had no idea it'd be 17 years and then I think with this one, honestly, what happened was I had a dinner with uh, Jerry Seinfeld, who's a friend of mine. I was asking him about the end of the series. I said, how did you decide? And long story, he kind of said, look, I've always believed creatively, you should never spend everything creatively because it's almost Herculean to start up again. You should always have something in the tank. Uh, leave the party before it gets too late kind of theory. And then somehow it spurs you into the next thing. And the, as he was talking, I went home and I said to Deb, on my way home in a cab, I said, "We've, I'm, uh, this is the last one. She goes, what? And I said, I just know this is the last one. And I woke up the next morning with this very strong idea, which Jim Mangle and I have been working on, mm -hmm. of treating it not like a comic book movie in any way, right. uh, treating him not like a superhero, but as a human being, you know, with who's lived a life of violence and let's make a movie about the ramifications of violence. And I was thinking The Wrestler, I was thinking Unforgiven, that kind of thing. And the moment I'd had that thought, I was supercharged, super excited, absolutely sure I wouldn't play it again and very nervous because it's 17 years. Uh, I mean, you're a theater man like me. It's like at the end of a long run, you really want your last show to be the best. Like you just, you don't want to finish on a bad note. That's true. And it wasn't until I saw the premiere in Berlin and I, literally at the end, I cried. I, I, and it was gratitude to Jim Mangold who pulled off something I, I'll forever be in debt to him. 17 year journey and also just actually seeing on screen what I'd held in my head and heart as a yes. possibility for the character. Oh, where's my boy? There he is. There he is. Oh. And how, how are you enjoying? <laughs> That's so cute teach you about yourself so much. Uh, if, if there's something you haven't resolved about your own upbringing, it's come back. Uh, and you need to kind of resolve all that stuff. But my kids are, more than anything, even in this metropolis, they make you slow down and they make you connect. I see him blossoming. I see him owning the things that make him unique. Um, and his confidence is just growing more and more. And she's just post a child. She goes, love school, love school, loves it. You know, she can't wait to go. She comes home, tells me all about her dad, and she's so like 